Hello, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's happy to see so many uh, old friends here. So my, my talk basically uh, focuses more on the practical side, and there are some academic elements, uh, not too much, but I do hope my friends here can contribute to the views towards the practical side. Now, uh, first about the objective of this presentation, I will first set out the background and history in the development of mediation in Hong Kong. Uh, obviously, uh, I can talk about that because of my age, uh, having been in Hong Kong for a long time. And then I will highlight the use of facilitated model as the major mediation model in Hong Kong, uh, how uh, it arises and how it evolved in the present stage. And then uh, I'll, I'll try to find out the impetus behind the development of evaluative mediation in Hong Kong, which is uh, at the moment uh, a kind of talk of the town. Uh, and I'll try to identify the possible issues in the development of uh, evaluative mediation. Uh, now this is my, my own observation. Now in my view, uh, uh, if we're talking about the current landscape of mediation in Hong Kong, there are uh, basically four driving forces. Uh, one is by the government's effort through different departments and bureaus. And then within different kinds of construction industry, mediation was adopted. Uh, as a kind of dispute resolution uh, through uh, some kind of standard form of building contracts or standard forms of contracts, in particular building contracts. And then the court system, i.e. the judiciary, has spent a lot of effort to promote the practice. Um, and there are, of course, uh, uh, thanks to be given to the different mediation bodies which uh, kept on evolving through these years. Now some some examples, or they date back to the earliest stage. Uh, if I try to look back, and I've done some kind of uh, prelim uh, library research, if we're talking about local uh, uh, publications, uh, mediation uh, in the 80s was rarely mentioned. But uh, something similar to mediation was mentioned uh, in some textbooks, which is about the Labor Department's conciliation service. Uh, uh, well, I, I have a feeling that the practice remained uh, pretty much the same until in recent years, uh, the Labor Department has adopted some kind of uh, training uh, for mediation techniques for their conciliation service. So if I look at the booklet concerning that practice today, it says, it, there, there's a description about the conciliation officer saying, the conciliation officer is a neutral intermediary who assists both parties to understand the problem and to have a frank dialogue so as to remove each other's differences and prevent the issues from deteriorating. He also endeavors to seek a settlement which is acceptable to both parties. Now that sounds very much like mediation. Uh, uh, something not mentioned here is that uh, in the department, the labor officer is actually under duty to remind the parties' rights under the labor, uh, labor ordinance, under the employment ordinance. So in that respect, the conciliation officer actually uh, is under duty to give some, some advice on the law uh, if the situation is appropriate. Uh, that differs somewhat from the uh, general facilitative mediation we are uh, now practicing in Hong Kong. And now I try to compare the position of the conciliation officer with that of mediator by reference, for example, to the Hong Kong Mouse website, the Hong Kong Mediation Accreditation Association Limited website. Talking about the mediation process, it's voluntary, non-binding, uh, private, uh, and that involves a neutral person, helps the parties to reach their own negotiated agreement. So as I said, uh, if you look at the conciliation officer's uh, duty, there's not much difference. Safe except that uh, as, as early as in the 80s, in this kind of dispute resolution offered by the Labor Department, uh, some kind of advice was expected from that neutral. Now, the advice expected from the neutral probably uh, has been one of the major reasons to fail a mediator who, who is assessed under the current system, if, if you're talking about mediation, because we are advocating a facilitative model. If you found a candidate giving advice, uh, uh, the person will be failed. Uh, but, but that's, that's assessment standard. How about in, in reality, whether that should be allowed? Now, if we go back to the driving force, uh, I mentioned the government. 
and the chief exec executive policy address uh, in recent years, in the past 10 years, always refer to mediation or other dispute res resolution. Uh, I, I must admit, even local people, maybe not too many of them will read that in detail, but I can find uh, reference to different uh, dispute resolution services. Uh, the, the newest one, 2017, uh, uh, paragraph 55, it says the Department of Justice is also stepping up its overseas promotion of Hong Kong's international legal and dispute resolution services through cooperation with international organizations. So we are, we are going international. And we are in discussion with the central authorities with the aim of entering into an agreement of Hong Kong's full participation in the Belt and Road Initiative with the, inter with the National Development and Reform Commission by the end of this year. The agreement will cover various areas such as, well, various areas, including this resolution, as well as the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Bay Area development. So it's not only, broadly speaking, international, we are uh, extending or trying to extend that service uh, into the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, the, the question on my mind was, uh, should we promote this kind of facilitative mediation or evaluative mediation? Uh, that's a difficult question, yet to be answered by many of us. And under the section of legal services, uh, it says, paragraph 114, the Department of Justice, uh, well, the chief executive uh, is placing, I think, huge burden on DOJ, uh, talking about DOJ. We'll implement various initiatives to consolidate Hong Kong's position as a center for international legal and dispute resolution services in the Asia-Pacific region. And one of the DOJ's priorities is to set up efforts in proactive promoting Hong Kong as an international legal and dispute resolution services center for the Belt and Road Initiative and the Bay Area. All right, so that was repeated, but emphasis is on DOJ's priorities. So, uh, similarly, uh, in, in line with that uh, incentive, uh, the government is rolling out uh, um, the legal hub program to promote these few resolution institutions to set up branches or offices in Hong Kong. So it's not only we are going out, we are inviting different bodies to come to Hong Kong, uh, making it a big party. Uh, but still, what are we going to offer in that big party? Are we going to offer the old dish that is facilitative model or something new? Uh, well, talent hub similarly uh, is making Hong Kong to become a talent hub, including, of course, um, the kind of uh, media service. Uh, now, other examples of uh, driving forces by the government, uh, the uh, Secretary for Justice uh, set up a working group on mediation in 2008, which gave rise to a consultation paper uh, prom uh, well, recommending a lot of different things to promote mediation. And in 2011, uh, there was a financial dispute resolution center being set up uh, as a result of the uh, Lehman Brothers saga uh, that uh, helped parties uh, or consumers who suffer loss uh, in the uh, sale process of financial products through the use of mediation and arbitration. Uh, and in 2013, the Secretary for Justice has, has set up uh, a steering committee on mediation. And then uh, I mentioned a consultation paper. Uh, one of the products was uh, the current Hong Kong Mediation Accreditation Association Limited, which was in operation on, a on the 2nd of April 2013. Now the purpose is to set up a, a unified standard for training and assessment of mediators in Hong Kong. Now, so far, uh, these moves all pointed to one single model, that is facilitated model of mediation. So, uh, the model of um, mediation training and accreditation uh, under Hong Kong Ma was purely facilitative as it, as it now. Uh, other public sectors, uh, well, I, I mentioned some conditions of contract. For the government, uh, as early as in 1991, uh, in the government general conditions of contract, we found a dispute resolution clause. That is basically a mediation uh, followed by arbitration clause. Uh, and then uh, many years later in 2005, 
in the private sector, uh, the standard form of building contract, the, uh, uh, well, from that time onwards, a mediation clause was in incorporated. So the private sector was much uh, left behind the public sector, actually, in that regard. Now, of course, in those uh, conditions, what kind of model is to be adopted is not mentioned. It's, it's left to the mediator in the mediation process to decide, or the parties to decide. And as yet, I, I repeat, in Hong Kong, uh, you talk about training, accreditation, it's all based on facilitative model. Practice, do you know the answer? In practice, do you know whether there's any, anyone doing kind of evaluative mediation? Yes, PSA, right? All right, you may, you may have heard, well, yes, in, in practice, probably, uh, if you are in some commercial disputes, having a professional uh, kind of background, such as construction or personal injuries. Now, the parties may invite a mediator having the background in that dispute. So, uh, if you talk about personal injuries case, probably the parties will choose a doctor or someone with a medical background. Uh, construction, some, they may choose someone with an engineering, surveying, or architect's background. So, naturally, the parties would hope that because of the background of the mediator, the mediator could give some view or advice for reference. So in reality, uh, peers, myself, have actually come across parties asking for, can you express a view on that issue? The question becomes, if you are a practicing mediator, uh, can you give a view? Or, or if that kind of practice is to be adopted in Hong Kong, uh, should there be any control? Or how the mediator's interest, the public's interest, could be better protected? Now, judiciary, uh, another driving force. Uh, well, uh, the judiciary has spent huge effort. Uh, there were pilot schemes launched as early as in year 2000, and then uh, 2009, there was a big time for Hong Kong uh, because uh, the civil justice reform was introduced. Uh, a, an important product is the practice direction number 31, which was enforced in 2010. And uh, we, I mean, uh, practice immediately in Hong Kong, we all know that since 2010, uh, the number of mediation cases upsurged by a lot because before that, most cases in Hong Kong were not referred or were uh, cases where the parties uh, actually voluntarily or voluntarily adopted the use of mediation. But uh, once the uh, practice direction started, whether uh, you volunteer to use mediation or you, you use mediation, you want to use it or not, under practice direction number 31, uh, there, there is some kind of semi-voluntariness. And the consequence is that number of cases increased by a lot. But I think we all, we all know that uh, number of cases increased by a lot, uh, success rate probably has, has been dropping, okay? Uh, now, I don't have empirical data to support that. Uh, that's a general feeling. Now, about family mediation, I mentioned that it was launched in 2000, year 2000. There was a pilot scheme, which result in, now for that pilot scheme, the success rate was very, very high. It's not mentioned here, it was actually 78%, including those, uh, where a full settlement and partial settlement were reached. And there were other different pilot schemes, uh, like in the Lens Tribunal, there was a pilot scheme concerning building management cases. And then there are various schemes offered by different mediation bodies, uh, like uh, there was a commercial mediation pilot scheme, new insurance mediation pilot scheme, uh, well, uh, like more than 10 pilot schemes offered by various different bodies of mediation, uh, including uh, those bodies which relate specific to the mediation, like Hong Kong Mediation Council, and other bodies which actually uh, uh, do not relate only to mediation, like Hong Kong Institute of Surveyors. Observation. Now, since the inception of mediation in Hong Kong, the model being promoted and used has been facilitative, or that is, uh, basically interest-based. And other models such as settlement model, evaluative model, and transformative, transformative model are rarely talked about. 
uh, speculative reason. I would like to invite views why, why that is the case. Why we talk about or we use facilitative model only but not others. Now in the earliest years, like when I was, when I started being taught about mediation year 2000 or thereabout, uh, practicing mediators, there were not too many. If they asked them, there was a general resistance to even not to uh, evaluative mediation, even to if you talk about evaluative mediation, they would say that's, uh, that's not allowed or that's misconduct, something like that. Okay. So there was a general resentment to this kind of practice. Uh, first, do you agree? Second, can you speculate the reason? Anyone? Well, I treasure the views from experienced mediators in the floor. Right? My, my feeling, uh, anyone? Well, you, you, can, you can express that you don't agree. You think uh, mediators in those days were very open. They open for any kind of model. Any view? Is it a sensitive topic that you don't want to express a view? <laughs> Media's audience. Uh, Media's audience was, was enforced in year 2013. So uh, you, I think you are too young to say year 2013 was early, early days of Media's for you. <laughs> so I'm talking about year 2000, all right, uh, more than 10 years ago. Uh, well, I, I guarantee if you express your view, I won't guess your age. <laughs> all right, anyway, okay. So sensitive topic. Now, I guess, I don't know, but truly, uh, um, now, if anyone claimed that he or she knew mediation in those days, uh, that person must have undergone some kind of training, okay? So maybe I was in the academic field, so I pay attention a lot to these training courses. All of them, all of them were based on a kind of facility model, and there was no evaluative model training course in Hong Kong. So if you are trained, you try to practice, you will stick to that kind of model being you are trained. And for the early, early batch of mediators, I don't know. Uh, I can't exclude the reason that if you, you don't have a particular, a specific professional background and you are uh, dying for cases, if you say that, when you say evaluative, uh, your thought will be, so I won't be chosen if I don't belong to certain professional group, all right? So in terms of, self-interest, they may say, well, that's no good, all right? They would, they would want to have any kind of cases being referred to them, at least in the early days. Uh, that was my guess. Um, well, and needless to say, I try to browse through all the books about mediation. Uh, whenever there's a, books, a book on mediation or any publication, uh, talk about mediation is all about facilitative model. I think that's natural. If we, we uh, go back to our stage one training course, all of them refer to a book called Getting to Yes. And it's because of this interest-based negotiation that that was so appealing that gave rise to uh, the interest-based mediation. But if you go back to evaluative mediation, uh, one would think that there's not much difference from a commercial negotiation or something like that, but is it the case? Uh, so uh, I will try to look at some examples showing why, or showing throughout these years there has been emphasis on, emphasis on the use of facility model. Uh, if you look at uh, some uh, rules of mediation, Oh, sorry, it's, it's actually a quote from uh, mediation ordinance. Okay, now the mediation ordinance. It says, mediation is a structured process comprising one or more sessions in, one, in which one or more impartial individuals without adjudic adjudicating, a, a dis adjudicating a dispute or any part of it assist the parties to the dispute to do any or all of the following. Okay, so uh, this few words, without adjudicating a dispute or any aspect of it have given rise to a lot of discussion at the time when the ordinance was enacted. So some says that 
but without adjudicating, it means that you can't express a view. And then the classic way of uh, looking at this word adjudicating, if you look up the law dictionary, uh, it, means, it means a decision to be imposed on the parties based on rightful contention. So uh, litigation, arbitration uh, are examples of adjudication uh, uh, based on that classic meaning. So there are different interpretations of these few words. So if you look at the ordinance, one thing is that by, by providing without adjudicating, uh, what it means is that you can't adjudicate, but there's nothing to stop you from expressing a view. That's, uh, that's not adjudicating, okay. Uh, it remains an open question, I guess, but, but you look at it, at least one will have a feeling that it's actually encouraging a facilitative model. But it's not actually saying, saying in clear words that evaluative model is excluded. And then, I mentioned this point before, uh, under the current assessment model of Hong Kong Mao, uh, there is a, an item to be assessed, refrain from advising. So if you have advised, you will be in trouble. All right? So you can't give view, you can't advise, uh, because we're talking about a facilitative model. And then in Hong Kong Mediation Code, In Hong Kong Mediation Code, there's a provision saying the mediator will not give legal or other professional advice to any party or impose a result on any party or make decisions for any party. So it is absolutely against e uh, a, an evaluative approach. Now with, with this kind of background, I think it will not be difficult to understand why uh, you look at the current landscape of mediation in Hong Kong, the landscape is flagged, all right, is purely facilitative model. But, but should the choice of mediation users be limited to facilitative mediation, all right? And then is there a market demand for the use of evaluative mediation? And are there disputes which would more appropriately be resolved through an evaluative model instead of a facilitative model? These are the questions. Well, ultimately, we're talking about a benefit to the users or making uh, uh, more choices for, for the users. Now there are a lot of different contentions or issues arising. Uh, there are many questions like, uh, is evaluative really a model of mediation or is it just a, an approach or a style in mediation which is something built on the existing model of a facilitative mediation? Uh, well, different experts have provided different answers on that topic. Now, if you go to the uh, very basic textbook by Lawrence Boo, uh, he mentioned four models, and he described that as models. Set settlement model, facilitative model, therapeutic, and evaluative model. And then, otherwise, you look at some uh, publication by Senna Sumeta, for example, he mentioned, she mentioned that there were three styles. And she described their styles, facilitative, evaluative, and transformative mediation. So she described that as evaluative mediation is a process model on settlement conferences held by judges and evaluative mediator assists the parties in reaching resolution by pointing out the weaknesses of the cases and predicting what a judge or jury would be likely to do. Uh, now, uh, it won't be difficult to understand that uh, if that's the case, that must be uh, an approach because you can do that within a facilitative model. And, and that is a pretty narrow approach uh, to the meaning of uh, evaluative mediation. If you read the article, you know, you know why. That was based on an impression or experience from something else. That is basically uh, uh, an early neutral evaluation. Uh, 2015, uh, the, uh, the Hong Kong Department of Justice organized a workshop uh, regarding intellectual property mediation, and where an academic, Dr. Alexander, described evaluative as being an approach instead of a model for mediation, which I entirely agree. Uh, as yet, I don't, we don't have any uh, uh, model of evaluative mediation. And of all the training courses I've come across, uh, 
evaluative is being uh, added or extended onto uh, a facilitative model. Now, if we want, we look at the differentiation between uh, a facilitative model and the evaluative model, probably the earliest publication uh, can be dated back to 1996 by Leonard Riskin. And he tried to uh, put that into some context of four quadrants. So the vertical axis range from uh, at, the, at the lower part, facilitated up to the evaluative at the top. And then from left to right, you have a narrow approach to a broad approach. So basically, whether you're using facilitative or evaluative model or approach, uh, it, it could be uh, based on the problem being defined as narrow or defined as broad. So you have a, a broad approach evaluative mediation and you have a narrow approach evaluative mediation. So if, if we focus on the upper portion of, the, of this four quadrant diagram, so left, top left hand corner, for example, you are, we are talking about uh, a narrow approach uh, evaluative um, mediation. So basically it urges and pushes the parties to accept narrow or position based uh, settlement. And then uh, proposes narrow or position based agreement, all right? Predicts court or other outcomes. Uh, assesses strengths and weaknesses of each side says cases. Now these actually tallies with uh, Senna Sumita's uh, um, view, which I described very narrow. But then uh, to the right hand side, when we talk about if you, we use evaluative mediation um, uh, in a broad sense, so that could be uh, urges or pushes parties to accept broad or interest-based settlement. It develop and uh, proposes broad or interest-based agreement or predicts uh, impact from interest of not settling, educate itself about parties' interest. So now that probably uh, uh, has clear a doubt on uh, some or most mediators mind that if you are doing evaluative mediation, can it be interest-based? The answer is, according to that, this diagram, yes. Uh, oh, there, there is another way of looking at uh, or comparing uh, the different types of mediation, evaluative, interest-based, narrative, and transformative. Um, An ex-judge from Singapore, uh, Doka Squirk, has published, published a paper uh, comparing facilitative and evaluative mediation. And he said, he, his, his question was, uh, well, these two kinds of mediation, uh, should they be really a dichotomy? In other words, uh, well, would, would it be the case that if it is not facilitative, it must be uh, evaluative? And he put forward that there are three elements of evaluative mediation. And that is, there is a kind of predictive behavior. The mediator will give a view on what will happen in court or other forums. Uh, there is a kind of directive behavior. And the mediator will direct the parties towards certain outcomes or solutions. And he also uh, try to narrow uh, the problem. Def uh, there is a narrow problem definition, focusing merely on legal rights and positions and neglecting underlying interests. Now, now, these are the uh, uh, quirk described as elements. Now, still, there is a matter of degree, all right? So, uh, so, if you are going back to, actually, Quirk's paper point to, if you're going back to uh, Riskin's grid, uh, you can have a, a broad approach as well. Now, in his paper, he raised two issues about evaluative mediation, and which which is actually uh, most mediators concerning Hong Kong. So if you are doing your evaluation, would that affect the neutrality of the mediator, or at least the perception of the mediator in the eyes of the parties? If you express a view, would any or all of the parties think that you are not neutral? And also it may affect the party's autonomy, which is always emphasized in the mediation. So in other words, in other words the solution or the settlement is no longer entirely based on the party's choice. So uh, the, the question is, uh, should it be 
Should evaluative mediation be a model by itself, or is it necessarily a blended process, meaning is an extended technique being added or extended approach being added to a facilitative model? Now, probably a uh, coincidence of time, uh, whilst my feeling is that in the field, uh, there are demands for an evaluative mediation uh, the DOJ at the same time was holding a lot of activities. I'm, I've mentioned the uh, seminar in 2015 that was uh, concerning intellectual property mediation. And then Hong Kong Mediation Council um, also have uh, organized a seminar in 2015 that this time is about construction disputes, also about evaluative model. Now, so far, you look at these activities, they are related to specific fields. So that points to a, an observation, that is, uh, when we talk about evaluative mediation, most people would think that, well, that would be more suitable for disputes where there's a specific field, like construction or IP, or I suggest personal injuries. But otherwise, you talk about general commercial practice, probably, uh, or family, or some family cases, maybe, uh, facility model is more suitable. But that's maybe that from the, from the gut feelings of the practitioners. Now, the uh, Secretary for Justice have expressed, has expressed his views on uh, the use of uh, evaluative mediation in practice. Um, on many occasions, um, uh, such as during that seminar I mentioned in 2015, he said, we also see the potential and advantages of using evaluative mediation when the nature of the disputes call for an evaluation of the issues involved. Okay. So I won't go through these, uh, save that I think uh, the Secretary for Justice had expressed uh, words to encourage the use of uh, evaluative mediation um, in uh, at least the IP field. Meanwhile, uh, in Hong Kong U, where I'm working, uh, 2015 and 2016, actually it was dated back to 2014, there were uh, small studies carried out uh, to um, study uh, the, about the demand for the use of evaluative mediation in Hong Kong for construction disputes. So, um, or acknowledgement of Ms. Sammy Yip, now in my department. Now, uh, I've not put in the actual figures in these bar charts. Uh, there are some general information, so amongst the group of mediators being studied, there are, uh, th there are diversified backgrounds, like architect, engineer, lawyers, surveyors, etc. Um, most of them, more than, more than 15 of them are lawyers. There are about 60 um, uh, people being, being uh, sent questionnaire and also interviewed. And then uh, they have various uh, seniority. And most of them have experience of between one to five years. And then about the type of training. Um, okay. And there are, they belong to different organizations, okay, uh, where they are accredited. Now about their experience in resolving all kinds of disputes. Uh, so, uh, they have learned different models, and most of them have learned well, expectedly facilitated model, uh, followed by some other models. All right, but the second most frequent occurrence is evaluative model. I, I don't know where they learned. There was no such question, but they, um, some of them said that they've been trained in that regard. And then a question on frequency of applying different uh, mediation models. Uh, there are different choices like always, sometimes, rarely, and never, all right? So the model they always use, uh, or most, most people would say facility model. Uh, there are a number of uh, people saying that they always use evaluative model, okay? And some of them say that sometimes they use, all right? Now, that reflects one thing, that is, if you look at practice in this area, uh, there exists, as a matter of fact, that there are mediators who might have not been trained 
about evaluative mediation, and they do evaluate during mediation. All right. So that is probably a market need. Otherwise, they won't have to do that. Uh, mediation experience in resolving all kinds of disputes. All right. So uh, probably that's not very relevant. Sorry, I'm mindful of the time. What? What? Uh, it's okay. All right. And now, uh, and then about the mediation experience in using facility model to resolve construction disputes. Uh, that is experience in resolving construction disputes using facility model. Most of them will say yes. Okay. And then about effectiveness of facility model, most of them said yes. So there's no doubt that yes, most of most of the mediator would regard. Uh, uh, using facility model as effective in resolving these fields. Now, how about how about using uh, evaluative model in con in resolving construction disputes? Okay. Uh, now, we uh, question number seventeen. I can't say that there is a large. Uh, well, well, of course, the majority uh, says no. Still, there is a fair portion saying yes. Uh, uh, evaluative model is useful. And now about, about uh, different effectiveness, uh, still there's a fair portion to say that that's effective. Okay. So when we ask, when we look at this raw data, when we ask, is there real need by users, apparently the answer is yes. Now, uh, if we try, we try based on these figures. And, and 2016, I've led another research uh, on uh, mediation regarding another kind of disputes. This time is about compulsory sale cases in Hong Kong. Uh, there is a set of data which is not yet, uh, well, which cannot be presented in an articulate manner as yet, as yet. But we have similar findings. That is, uh, mediators actually are practicing evaluative mediation, or they are doing evaluation in the mediation in Hong Kong. So, if more and more mediators are using that, uh, public interest becomes an issue. And the question is, uh, there are a lot of uh, measures I think we ought to in, impose, or else the public interest may be at stake. So uh, at the moment, I, I mentioned that the DOJ has started a special uh, committee on evaluative mediation. And uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, measures to be worked out, like, well, should we, should we find any internationally accepted training approach and assessment standard if we are to impose this kind of evaluative mediation? And, and also, if one is going to be an evaluative mediator, uh, quite clearly that uh, in terms of liability, that will, that will be different. Because if you are, you are expressing a view, uh, uh, it's more likely that, uh, or it may, it may more likely to attract some kind of negligent suit. So, uh, whether, pro whether in terms of protecting the mediator the, or the public, uh, professional indemnity insurance becomes an issue. So that is yet to be worked out. And otherwise, like other professionals, CPD requirements, etc. So some recent developments in tandem with this kind of development. Uh, I mentioned that the DOJ, sorry, the Secretary of Justice have set up a uh, special committee on uh, evaluative mediation in 2017, and also in Hong Kong Mediation Council. Likewise, a working group on evaluative mediation was set up this year. And the um, uh, British RICS conducted a training course on evaluative mediation uh, in October this year. So uh, it looks like it's taking off. Uh, there are uh, a number of issues yet to be sorted out. But uh, with uh, uh, the little survey I've done, uh, probably there's some support at least to that practice. All right. Uh, is that is there any question? Thank you.